I need a clicker here. Sorry about that. Uh, I didn't get a clicker. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Unless you count lunch and recess, I was one of those kids that did not care for school or for studying when I was younger. And as I grew older, my interest in school, math in particular, was completely non-existent. When I was in high school, I sported this absolutely terrible mullet spiked haircut. And I had friends that would literally let me copy all of their homework. Math, science, uh, mythology, I literally had help with all of it. And I remember it was my second senior year, my second because I skipped so much school the first year I couldn't pass. And so during the second year, I had taken the exact amount of credits I needed to graduate. So long as I actually passed the classes, I would graduate. Well, in this mythology class, we had a collage that we all had to turn in, and you could not pass this class unless you did the collage. Well, the whole semester goes by, and I, of course, hadn't even started my collage. And the last day comes, and the teacher says, everybody turn in your collage, and I panicked, realizing I'm going to have a third senior year because I haven't even started this. And then my best friend, Larry Imhoff, walked up, and he said, Jason, do I know you better than anybody? And I said, yes, why? And he goes, because I knew you wouldn't do your homework and you wouldn't graduate. So I did two collages so that you could. And he gives me a second collage. And to this day, that's the reason I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and the kicker is, is that the collage that he did for me, I got an A minus on. And the collage he did for himself, he got a B plus. <laughs> yeah. And we still laugh about it to this day. Well, after graduation, Life continued on like one big spring break. I mean, we would go out to bars and party nightly, and having bad hair and working out was literally a priority for me at the time. As long as we could party, chase girls, and goof off, which we definitely did a lot of, things seemed good, life seemed good, relative to what I knew then, of course. But it still seemed good. My life was maybe a mile wide, but it was only an inch deep. <laughs> And before I knew it, over 10 years had gone by, and I was still living the exact same way. Well, then in 2002, life took a dramatically different turn, but it started off like many other nights with me going to a karaoke bar with some friends. They had, my friend Angela was on a first date, and they had too much to drink, and they needed a ride home. So I went to pick them up. I wound up singing a song, and I had a Coke, paid the bill, and left. Well, unbeknownst to us, there was two thugs there that would get tipped off by a server as to who had cash, and they would attack and rob you when you left. So as we leave this bar, I was attacked from behind. From my perspective, I didn't see anything at all. I just heard and felt this deep thud in the back as something smashed into the back of my head, and I saw this flash of light, similar to what you hear boxers describe when they get knocked out. And the next thing I knew, I was on my knees, just getting pummeled, you know, from all different directions. Well, I remember having this feeling that I was going to die right then and right there. And I then had the next feeling I had was this strange acceptance that life was about to end. And then this fight or flight instinct came on and I had no chance to flee, so I fought and I pulled out my absolute best jujitsu move that I learned when I was younger. It's called biting somebody on the leg. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did. I grabbed this guy's leg and I bit him on the inside of the thigh just as hard as I could, but he was wearing these big baggy pants and all I got was fabric and I cracked my front teeth. And as I was trying to bite him, his friend just kept kicking me in the head and the back repeatedly until finally he said, give me your goddamn jacket. And I threw my jacket off, rolled away, and they took it and took off. Well, my friend Angela took me to the hospital, which was luckily right across the street. And I was diagnosed with a concussion and a bruised kidney. And they gave me this really powerful narcotic pain shot and sent me home. And I remember on the way home thinking how strange everything looked. Well, the next day when I woke up, it was obvious that the pain meds were not the cause of what was making everything look so strange. 
when things moved, they moved in these bizarre stop action frames, like individual discrete picture frames with a line connecting them. And bright light seemed somehow amplified, and the jagged edges of these picture frames made these beautiful and elegant patterns as things moved. And I was absolutely entranced and mesmerized by the fact that this must be how our brain constructs a moving image, just like a video camera with individual discrete pictures. Help to excuse me, having a brain injury sometimes causes memory issues here. <laughs> there we go. Well, anyway, our brains normally smooth out these frames. And I remember looking at my hand and trying to draw what I saw, and I literally drew hundreds of pictures. And I have a few of them here for you today. And I remember looking at my hand, and it was literally like looking at it for the first time. If you look at it here, it may look smooth from a distance, but when you zoom in closer, you see that it's really not smooth. It's made from all of these tiny, straight lines. And as it turns out, there is mathematics to describe this. It's called a polar integral. But at the time, all I knew was that the smoothness or the fluidity of motion was gone. And I would look at my hand, and I would move it back and forth, faster and slower. And as I moved it faster, the picture frames were farther apart. And as I moved it slower, the picture frames were closer together. And I wondered, how could I not have seen this before? And then I thought, how can I effectively describe this to somebody else? And then the last question I had was, is, do I dare even tell anybody about this at all? Well, eventually, obviously, I tried, I, I started to talk about it. And a good way for me to explain it is to imagine you're watching television. And you know how on television you can see frame by frame by frame? Well, the way I see is like that, only in real time. And I noticed it gave everything this slightly pixelated or grid-like quality. Well, then one day, my little daughter Megan, who was born during my wild years, she asked me how the television worked. And I said, little rectangle pixels, they change color. And as they change color, that changes the picture. Well, right as I said that, a commercial came on with a big O. And you know how kids sometimes see right to the core of a problem? She said, Dad, that's impossible. How do you make a circle with rectangles? And it was like a door in my mind that I had never opened, opened up. And I walked through it and realized, you can't. You can make the pixels half that size and half that size all the way to infinity. But the edge of the circle will always be a zigzag, even though the resolution gets finer. In other words, perfect circles literally don't exist. It was a day I will never forget, a moment that I realized that I could understand things that I never thought I could. And more than anything, I wanted to share this. But there was also some serious negative side effects that came with this. I developed agoraphobia, OCD, uh, post-traumatic stress, and I literally locked myself away in my house and would not leave unless I had to get something absolutely essential. I had blankets covering the windows so that not a beam of light could get into the house, and this self-imposed isolation went on for over three years until one day I ran out of food and I actually had to leave the house. And so I went to the mall and I had a sandwich, and while I was there, I was drawing and I ran into a physicist and we started talking, and I found that as we were talking, we were talking about similar things, but just in two different ways. For instance, when he would talk about pi, he would say things like f of the x and big squeeze theorem. But when I talked about pi, what I saw was something similar to the pixel analogy. I saw a shape that was forever getting smoother and smoother and smoother as you sliced it into smaller slices. And it would forever approach a circle, but never reach it. Or when he would talk about square roots or exponents, for instance, 8 to the third power, he could be talking about 8 times 8 times 8, which is 512. But what I saw was literally a cube, that it was composed of smaller and smaller cubes. And this cube, you can see it has 8 cubes on each side, and you square those 8 into 64, and you stack those 64 8 high, and you get 512. So 8 to the third power and this drawing are literally one and the same thing. 
Or when he would talk to me about fusion, he could be talking about things like this. Where is when I talked about fusion, what I saw was this, a geometric timed implosion that would get the atoms close enough together so that they could fuse. Well, he gave me the best advice of my life that day when he said, maybe you should go back to school and try to learn traditional mathematics so you can say this in a language that we all understand. And that's what I did. I went and I enrolled in Math 99, Algebra 1 at Tacoma Community College, and I was blown away the first day when my teacher, Tracy Haney, graphed an equation. And I said, you mean all these equations can be graphed into a shape? And she said, yes. And I said, wow, then we are talking about the same thing, but just in two different ways. And from that day, I was completely hooked. I would find myself in the math lab for hours and months at a time, trying to absorb all this incredible, beautiful knowledge that I had completely ignored previously in my life. Well, then one day, I was in the math lab, and a friend that I had talked to came in all excited and he said they were studying interference patterns and when he showed me these a feather could have knocked me over because the interference patterns were identical to many of my drawings here we have actual interference patterns and, and a drawing of a fractal that I drew and it gave me this great feeling that I was on the right track I didn't want to be that crazy guy who thought he saw math everywhere but really didn't and so it gave me this feeling that yes I was on the right track and and learning the right way well then shortly after that I was in the cafeteria at school sitting at a table drawing and I ran into this beautiful woman and as we started talking, I managed to get a conversation going with her, and I talked about typical things that guys do, like pi and relativity and drawing, and somehow managed to get her interested in talking to me. And as we talked, she said what a lot of people had told me. She said, when you show me the drawings and you say this in layman terms, it makes the concept really easy to understand. And she said, I wish I would have learned it that way before I took these math classes, so the concept would have been embedded first. Well, that woman, she inspired me to get out of the house and try to change the world in a positive and meaningful way. And so that is my mission, to try to inspire students, to try to help create scientists. And that beautiful woman that I met that day that inspired me to get out of the house, she is now my wife, and we just had a beautiful baby girl. And because of them, and because of this attack, and because of mathematics, Life couldn't be any better. Thank you so much.